Welcome to Disruption Dialogues Podcast Season 2. Listen to the influential leaders and trailblazers from around the world as they share invaluable insights to navigating the fifth industrial revolution. Hello and welcome to another episode of Disruption Dialogue Season 2. I am Yamini Jain, Vice President Healthcare at Markets and Markets, and today I'm in conversation with Guy Rachmuth, Vice President Corporate Strategy Enterprise at IQVIA. Thank you for joining us today, Guy. Thank you for having me. Guy Rachmuth, VP of Corporate Strategy at IQVIA, drives strategic growth. Previously, as VP of Strategy at Q2 Solutions, he led M&As for IQVIA, which led to an acquisition. With 15 plus years in healthcare, he's a seasoned entrepreneur, founding firms in mobile health and AI-driven neurostimulation. His academic journey includes a BS in biomedical engineering from Boston University, an MS from Harvard, and a PhD from Harvard MIT HST program, along with a postdoc research at MIT in biomedical engineering. So the chosen topic for today's podcast is transforming healthcare through technology, innovation, and challenges. Um, so, you know, very interesting topic, Guy. And, and to start with, I think to set the context, it'll be good to def, uh, define healthcare versus life sciences, you know, for the context of our conversation. Absolutely. So thank you very, very much for having me again. So as I think about healthcare versus life sciences, I mean, healthcare is sort of the larger umbrella and that includes, you know, patient care. It includes the physician networks. It includes the payers. And of course, it includes the interventions that are being designed by life sciences companies. So when I say the word life sciences, what we typically think about is pharma and med device companies um, who are really designing net new treatments to support patient care. Right. And what do you think, you know, how do you think these two differentiate with respect to mega trends or really how, the, you know, what are the processes that are being followed in these two industries? So any highlight around that would be helpful for the audience. Sure. So if you think about life sciences, if their goal is to design and, and distribute a new therapeutic intervention uh, or even a diagnostic, that's actually a product development life cycle. And so innovation comes in in many different ways. Um, and it's a little bit easier to adopt when you're designing a new product. In healthcare, you're also delivering care directly by the physicians um, and, and patients uh, themselves. And so what happens there is it really, the technology uh, has to be very gingerly selected so that you, you kind of manage um, to not disrupt the patient care itself. Um, and there's, a, there's an element of change management. So most technologies that we typically see get adopted by, by companies that have very low regulatory requirements and that are looking to innovate their, 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 their timelines. Um, in healthcare, you know, it's a little bit more careful, a little bit more judicious as to what technologies and what innovations you're really willing to adopt uh, in the early side of the cycle. Great. And, you know, talking a bit or sprinkling a little more light around generative AI, biomarkers and big data, how do you think, you know, in the field of healthcare, how are these technologies emerging, such as Gen AI, biomarkers, big data, contributing to improve patient care, treatment outcomes, and operational efficiency? And are there any successful implementations yet? Yeah, really good question. So if you think about it, you know, big data sort of came first. Um, and that's really the idea that there's a lot of different information that is being captured, especially with the emergence of digital technologies, that is helpful to be analyzed so that it can actually inform patient care. Um, you know, our company has been in the forefront of big data for the last 70 years, where we try to collect and support um, uh, our customers with, with giving them back information about how their products are being used in the marketplace. Um, there's a lot of um, use cases that have been successful where big data being analyzed, creating uh, answers for clients has supported the development of new technologies. So generative AI is a new new type of technology that's really, the, the uniqueness about it is the ability to create new content from what historically is um, has been captured. The application to healthcare is needs to be extremely careful because what generative AI systems are generating new information that has not necessarily been vetted or approved by a human. And so if you think about big data on the front end, which is analysis of information and creating predictions, 
And you think about Gen AI on the front end producing those predictions, but potentially having the ability to produce new predictions without any oversight. Um, the application of big data is a lot more successful to date than, than generative AI. Where we do see the application of generative AI in the future is in making sure that um, patients are being communicated with, with a lot of empathy and a lot of context to support their decision-making process. But we are very careful to make sure that Gen AI isn't producing um, uh, definitive answers that are being relied upon purely to, to create um, physician decision making. Right. So there's certainly, you know, a lot of advantages in areas where this is being used and implemented. What do you think, uh, you know, that the flip, the, the, the flip of the coin is common challenges and barriers faced by healthcare organizations when they're using this? And uh, any ways that they're already um, using to address these issues to achieve better results? Absolutely. So I think one of the biggest challenges is really the lack of knowledge of the value that some of these technologies can bring to the table. The most successful organizations have pilot programs where they're starting out by, by trying out these early technologies in very limited settings. Um, what you typically see is you know, the lack of budget and maybe the lack of, of resources to deploy in order to do something that's really more on the margin of their main business. So, you know, I think one of the recommendations that I would have is to, to try to have a small group that's really trying to innovate and produce small ideas to, to introduce into new in, into the care setting, as opposed to trying to go in and adopt something once it's been proven um, at large scale. So I recommend a little bit more of a uh, stepwise approach to adoption. Sure. Um, can we also talk a little bit about blockchain and metaverse? How is all of that coming together? How is that playing? What's the intersection of blockchain and metaverse in healthcare? Absolutely. So blockchain is an interesting technology that's really allowing um, the ability to track information in, in a way that you know that it's it's you know it's providence. In blockchain technology, you know, the way we think about it is, you know, what are some use cases that other industries are seeking to, to design using this technology? And in healthcare and in life sciences, we try to see what are the problems that our clients are trying to solve? What are the use cases that are being used in other industries? And there are, are there some intersections? Mm. Um, so one, one example would be in one of our businesses, we do a lot of patient testing and so we collect samples from patients and send them to a central lab laboratory to perform the testing. One of the challenges is to make sure that those samples are always, always have a chain of custody that's very understandable and, and, and auditable because you don't want to produce the wrong result um, or, or you certainly don't want to send the uh, result to the wrong patient. Blockchain is a technology that can enable that. And mm -hmm. so that one of the questions that we ask in our business is, can we adopt blockchain as a technology to help us with, with um, making sure that sample providence is, is um, it can be relied upon? It turns out that blockchain itself is actually overkill for some of the uh, problems that we're trying to solve, but we learned a lot about the ability to, to intersect, um, you know, these new emerging technologies with even our current processes, and it actually helped us improve the process that we use to track samples uh, by virtue of piloting and 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 really playing around with blockchain technology. Interesting. I think that's great. So, is it safe to say blockchain is also kind of a part of mega data? Um, you know, mega data or the big data that the healthcare industry is now generating? Absolutely, and and it's one of the most powerful data because it's data that can't be can't be changed, right? The whole beauty with blockchain is that if one person knows it, that the entire system knows it and it's uneditable. Um, and so that data can be relied upon to produce analytics. And that's actually the biggest value of generating data is to produce an answer, to analyze and produce some sort of um, predictive, uh, uh, predictive uh, recommendation. You know, I think um, the moment you talk about big data and analytics and AI and Gen AI and artificial intelligence playing a key role in patient outcomes, you can't ignore regulatory. So how do you think, you know, the healthcare providers and organizations are striving to navigate these complex regulatory landscapes? 
How are they ensuring data privacy, you know, patient privacy? How how is all that shaping up and data sharing, collaboration? Uh, you know, what's what what's the scenario there? Absolutely. So I actually think the regulatory dimension is probably one of the most important ones to consider in our space. In healthcare, every decision impacts a patient and impacts it could potentially be life altering, if not life saving. And the regulatory authorities have evolved to make sure that we don't uh, over promise and under deliver. They would rather under promise and over deliver. And any new technology that comes into the table has to go through a lot of convincing of the regulatory authorities. And not, and by the way, not just um, it's not a global scenario. Every country has their own regulatory authorities and they don't yeah. necessarily adopt each other's. And so if you have to convince the FDA in the United States, you separately and independently have to convince the regulatory authorities in Japan, in China, in EMEA, and now in the UK as an example, South Africa, you name it. Um, so companies have, ha have to kind of think about how they're going to go about it. I think, again, um, two things. One, you want to engage early with the regulators to understand what's the current state of what they accept from a, a submission perspective of anything, right? Any any kind of regulatory authority that requires a, an approval. What is the data that they accept today? What's the data that is being generated by the new technology? And how can you make sure that you can get them comfortable that the new data that you're submitting is actually extremely similar um, and serves the same purpose as the current data that they're accepting today? And that's a journey and it takes years, if not decades, uh, for some of these technologies to get the, the widespread acceptance of, of usage. Sure. And are companies also, also doing or taking some initiatives around data sharing and collaboration to be more compliant to regulatory? Yeah, so there's this whole idea of pre-competitive collaborations. A lot of consortiums are popping up for data standards. Um, between you know relatively competitive companies so not only in the tech industry but even even in life sciences large pharma put, put, puts together consortiums and makes sure that the data that they generate um is 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 a certain standard so that all of them can talk to the fda in the same manner um so there's a lot of conversations in some of the conferences that we go to about pre-competitive sharing of frameworks of standards and uh, that's actually an incredibly important way to to push the industry forward. Great. So, uh, you know, Guy, to, to sum up our discussion, what do you think are the global trends and the best practices that can be identified in the adoption and implementation of, you know, everything we talked about, Gen AI, biomarkers, AI, blockchain, metaverse. So if, if you really had to take a step back and talk about the trends, what do you think are some of the trends and how do they vary by regions? Sure. I think, at least in our space, one of the mega trends that I keep an eye out is the fact that our population is getting older yeah. and mm -hmm. living longer. And Absolutely. with living longer comes chronic conditions. And one of the things that I think about a lot is <laughs> if a lot of people are staying alive longer and having chronic condition, how are we going to be able to pay for healthcare across the globe? Because that's an incredibly important. Um, thing that society provides for, for, for humanity is to support healthcare. Um, so one of the trends, so the trends that we keep keep an eye out is how can technology help simplify patient deliver patient care delivery? Um, so any kind of digital technology, the adoption of um, smartphones, the adoption of um, wearables, the adoption of you know fast techno fast um, data processing that you get with 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 the supercomputers and such. Those things are all can be applied into healthcare in order to be able to democratize and distribute care to as many people as possible at a relatively lower cost. Obviously, different countries are in a different phase of their journey, um, but those technologies and the, the widespread adoption of them is, is a critical road to, to really support global healthcare. Um, the way we think about it is to make sure that you start out early and you analyze the application of those technologies in your relatively narrow use case so that you can gain some credibility. Then you can go to the regulators, convince them that technology is viable and useful, and then you can start to iterate on different use cases. And, and so you, you eventually build that sort of a staircase of value over time. I think, you know, doing something, trying to solve a very large problem with 
unproven technology is is probably a recipe for disaster and, and going to end up with uh, in the trash heap of history. So we have to be very careful how we apply new technology, you know, one step at a time and to make sure that um, we get buy in from the different stakeholders, including regulators and of course patients. Yeah, I think you made a great point. You know, this can uh, all of this needs to be leveraged in a positive way. And how do you think can this be leveraged to maximize the potential in the industry? You know, bring it to uh, more developments, more accessibility. You talked about, you know, average lifespan increasing. So how do you think all of this can contribute to maximize the industry's potential? Yeah, I think, you know, Continuing to have curiosity within the businesses, um, you know, don't just keep your head down doing what you're doing today. Continue to read and understand that there's innovation coming through every day. Um, you know, create a small team that's really focused on looking at the future, mm -hmm. empowering them with pilots. And there's no other way to adopt technology until you get people to to try them out and, and see that they actually work. Um, so to to maximize the, the potential of our industry is to empower small small groups of people to actually pilot and show that they work. Um, and the, the, some, those are some of the applications that, uh, some, some of the approaches that we've done here, uh, at least in my company. Absolutely, and I think my learning out of this is keep keep experimenting and don't, 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 don't be fearful of the failure because I'm sure in the journey that also comes. A hundred percent. And I'll give you one last example. If you think about them, you mentioned the word metaverse earlier. So metaverse, for those who don't know, it's just the uh, digital manifestation of, of humanity, right? So people are creating some, um, you know, digital environments and, and people actually live there. Well, you know, I keep thinking about, well, how, how does that apply to healthcare? There are ways that the metaverse would apply to healthcare, but we live in the real world. Our bodies work in the real world. We can't necessarily go into a digital world and unless you kind of, you know, in the far future, kind of upload your brain kind of thing. So, so there are technologies that really don't have an application, and as soon and the sooner you sort of understand that and move on with an, investing in the things that do make sense, the better. So again, exactly what you said, Yamini yeah, is you know making sure that we continue to push innovation and piloting and experimentation fast. Wonderful, you know. Thank you so much, Guy. It was it was a great conversation. You know, while all of this topic looks very um, oh, everybody's talking about it. Everybody knows about it. But the real, uh, you know, the devil is in the detail. And, and it was so good to talk to you about that. So thank you, everybody, for listening in. I was in conversation with Guy Remoth, Vice President, Corporate Strategy Enterprise at IQVIA. And thank you, Guy, once again. I thoroughly enjoyed the session. I hope you did as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. And stay tuned for such interesting episodes on Disruption Dialogues. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to know how you can navigate and thrive in this disruptive era, subscribe to Disruption Dialogues on your go-to podcast channels and stay tuned for more interesting episodes.